Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Science and Entertainment Exchange event. Uh, Rick, it's a LabEx event, too. Oh, that's right. Here at the NAS, we actually uh, like our colleagues and enjoy their programming. So we're going to do a mashup this week of two programmatic events. Kate, would you like to tell us a little bit about LabEx for the uh, Science and Entertainment Exchange audience? Absolutely. So LabEx is kind of the wild card of the National Academy of Sciences here. Or that like weird cousin who tries and tinkers and experiments with different events, with different games, people, series, partners, you name it. We will try it. Um, sometimes they fail, sometimes they don't. Um, and that's kind of our MO. Um, we're honestly a test bed is exactly how you should describe us. So we have, have some cool programs and products that we've been doing. We've been busy baking cookies uh, and crafting cocktails with chemists, say that fast. Um, and that's on YouTube in our Chemists in the Kitchen uh, series. We also have an app on the App Store, and it involves cats and spaceships. Um, check it out. It's called Cat Colony Crisis, and you learn a thing or two on the way. Um, and we have most recently did our own show called Wrong Answers Only, which is um, the mashup here today. And we, what we do there is we have one scientific expert and three comedians and we basically play wait, wait, don't tell me style games. Um, and, you know, we might learn some science on the way, but it's it's a lot of fun and you're going to get a kind of a taste of it here. And for those of you uh, who have never seen a speed dating event, we usually have five to seven scientists come on screen uh, individually and they have about five minutes to blow your mind. And so that's the science uh, speed dating format. Uh, the Science and Entertainment Exchange, if you are a writer, producer, studio executive, storyteller in mass media, you uh, can call us up and we will connect you to a scientist who hopefully knows the answer to your questions. Uh, and we've done over 3,300 consults, including every Marvel movie since Iron Man 2. Um, and we work on documentaries, feature films, TV shows, video games. So if you are a STEM professional from the LabX audience, especially, and you're just hearing about what we do, uh, please do put up your hand and volunteer. Uh, we'd be very interested to hear from you. We're always looking for uh, those field experts. Uh, I have to thank uh, the exchange's sponsors, uh, in particular HHMI, who uh, bankrolled a lot of this event today as an exchange event, and also uh, let you all know that we get major funding from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, as well as many individual donors like you. Thank you to everybody who donated today, especially those who joined at the supporter level. You will be getting one of these, and you will also be getting VIP access to some of our events, including... Uh, you know, extra special Q&A sessions. I want to thank Courtney Sloan, Sachi Gerben, and Jeff Fishman on the back end of the exchange, the staff who, without whom, we could definitely not do these events. Uh, and then Kate on the LabX side. Of course, I want to thank my coworkers too. Um, uh, to Carrie, Rick, Monique, and Anne. Uh, they've been kind of the backbone on our end. And it's, it's, it's a team, let me tell you. So today's event, our super host is going to be Ahmed Best, the host from Speed Dating, uh, with a nod to Chris Stuffy for all of his work on Wrong Answers Only. Uh, so he'll be back at the next installment of Wrong Answers Only. Uh, so Ahmed Best is an actor, producer, musician, generally good at everything kind of guy who also co-hosts the Afrofuturism podcast with Dr. Lonnie Brooks. He is a USC professor as well. I don't know when he sleeps. Ahmed, welcome. It's your show, man. Thank you so much, Rick and Kate. I really appreciate you guys. We are going to have a great time today. We have some phenomenal scientists, phenomenal comedians, and I'm here too. Um, okay, so here is how this works. There's going to be two segments per scientist. First segment is always the same. It is the uh, Science and Entertainment Exchange kind of speed dating idea of giving you five minutes to blow your mind. So the scientist is going to come on and they're going to blow your mind. They, that's what they do. That's their professional mind blowers, right? And then second segment is we're going to introduce our comedians and we're going to play a game. And it's going to be a game show style game that you will all find out about when we get there. If you'd like to participate, there's a poll right there. I think my fingers point to it, right? Yes, there is. You can practice. You can, you can participate on the poll. Feel free and feel free to like leave some comments, you know, tell us how funny we are and how smart we are and how your mind is blown. I would love to introduce our phenomenal comedians and they are Lisa Curry, Aparna Nancherna, 
and Allie Goldberg. Hi, y'all. Hello. I'm so incredibly excited. I am a big fan of every single one of you, and I can't wait to um, expose you to a bunch of <laughs> amazing, mind blowing scientists. How many have, have you guys all? This is your first um, science exchange event. Have you been fans of the exchange or LabX? You guys know what's going on? You know what's going to happen? Big fan of science. Big fan. Oh, yeah. Great. Yeah. This is my first event, um, although I did compete in Science Olympiad uh, in elementary school. So basically, I'm a scientist. Boom. Done. I, I've done wrong answers only before, and I'm famously anti-science. So I'm kind of <laughs> a wild card here. That's how, that's how we like it. We like wild cards. Yeah. We can yeah. not only blow your mind, but change your mind. Okay. So enough of me talking, because I really want to get to I, This is so exciting. This is my favorite part. Um, and this is why I love speed dating, because every time a scientist comes on and says something, I'm always left just incredibly in awe, amazed, and I learned something that I've never known before, right? So the first scientist we are going to introduce is Corey Moreau. She's a professor at Cornell University, an expert on ant evolution and their gut microbiomes. I'm telling you, this is, this is going to be ridiculous. Corey, how are you? I'm wonderful. It's really great to be here. It's really great to have you. I cannot wait to hear what you're about to say. It's probably going to be something about ants. It's going to be something incredible. So you got five minutes. I took four of them, four seconds of it. Five seconds. Go ahead. Blow our minds. Go. Blow our minds. <laughs> great. So imagine I'm standing in the middle of a jungle, hot and sweaty, collecting ants, and all of a sudden I get stung by a bullet ant. Now a bullet ant is called a bullet ant because when it stings you, it feels like you were shot by a gun. And I got stung right on the tip of my finger. And within seconds, I had this excruciating pain shooting up my arm all the way into my armpit and just sitting there. The tip of my finger was flaming hot. It was burning. If I would have put it to your face, you would have pulled back as it was so intense. Now, this might not sound surprising to you. I study ants, like, you know, maybe no surprise I get stung by a very venomous ant. But I've actually spent most of my career studying ants that don't bite or sting intentionally because I don't like to be in pain. But somehow I ended up studying these ants because I have students that seem to go completely against whatever I recommend, which is why they're way smarter than me. But I've had students work on bullet ants on army ants, on acacia ants, and in all cases, who ends up getting stung? Me. <laughs> but, you know, I think that people would ask, well, why have you focused your career so narrowly? Why work only on ants? But I want to tell you guys that there are more species of ants than all the birds and mammals added together. And in fact, um, they're amazing creatures. They're found on every continent except Antarctica. Um, and they have some really cool behaviors. One thing you may not realize, you've probably all seen ants in your life. Every ant you've ever seen is female, unless they had wings. So all of the work done within a colony, all of the you know, building of the mounds, all the caring for the young, battling in the sidewalk cracks, that's all done by females. Males and new queens are only produced once a year and they both have wings. And they go off on a mating flight and then the male dies almost right away. So a male's only job is to be this flying sperm sack to reproduce. He doesn't care for the colony at all. So ants do lots of crazy things. Um, you know, they're the world's first farmers. So if you've ever seen leafcutter ants walking through the Central and South American rainforest, they're carrying those bits of leaves back to their nest, not to eat the, the actual leaf, but to grow a mushroom or a fungus that's their food. So they've been doing this for about 50 million years. So if you think humans have invented things, I guarantee you ants have done almost everything first. So my own research spans from going out to the field. I've been able to transverse jungles across the entire world collecting ants. But most of what I do is actually based on DNA and genomics. So we bring our ants back to the lab. Sometimes we do additional experiments on them, but we're using the DNA to understand things about the evolution of the ant and as Ahmed mentioned, their gut microbiomes. And some of the things that we've been able to uncover is we've been trying to figure out, you know, how are all those species related? Um, what part of the world um, did the ants originate? Why do some parts of the globe have more species than others? And how their microbiomes help them shift onto novel diets? And so what we've been able to show using all these molecular and genomic tools 
is that ants sort of diversified in the shadow of the flowering plant forest. That when the flowering plant forest expanded across the globe, ants really took advantage of all these new niches and opportunities. And we also have been able to show that when ants become obligate mutualists with plants, so in this case, what happens is the plant outsources all of its defense to ants. And so the ants live entirely in the tree and get all their nutrients and resources from the plant. So in return, they're defending the plant. When they've been locked into this tight evolutionary relationship, it changes the evolution of the genome of the ants and they speed up their evolution. And lastly, by looking at the gut microbiome, we've been able to demonstrate that ants that have extreme diets, so whether you're feeding it as an entirely um, herbivore or vegan versus whether you're entirely predatory and only eating other animals, you have more bacteria in your gut. And in the case of the herbivores, what we've been able to show is that in all those cases, the bacteria are synthesizing essential amino acids and providing it back to the host. So essentially what they're doing is they're enriching their diet. And it's not just sort of to produce these amino acids for no reason. They actually then, the ant uses it to build a harder armor. So some of the most tough cuticles or armor are, are on herbivorous ants. So ants are in a remarkable group of organisms. Um, if people ever have questions about ants or microbiomes or evolution or DNA and genomics, please feel to reach out to me. The other passion I have is for museum collections. So if you ever want to know why museum collections are so critically important, feel free to reach out to me. Incredible. That was ridiculous. Two questions before we get to our game from the audience. One, um, I'm sure you you heard that ants are being pushed to for us to eat, right? So um, how do you feel about eating them, those of which you study, and which ant is the tastiest? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I think many people are pushing towards eating insects in general just because they have a lar lower carbon footprint on our planet and have our filled with protein and some have lots of fat. So it's a great source of nutrition. Um, I have not eaten a ton of species of ants. I have eaten a few. Um, there's a, an ant called the green tree ant that tastes like lemon that they use in Australia. And of course the leaf cutter queens in South America, they fry them up and they pull the wings off and they're like this nutty, crunchy little treat, almost kind of like a pork crackling. Wow, and those are the those are the male ants with the wings that they're eating it's, as pork. Well, in this case, it's the females because the females are fatter and have a bigger body. But I probably hmm. could eat the males as well. Nice. Wow, so fascinating. Mind blown. Okay, <laughs> so with that, we are going to ask our three comedians one at a time. Actually, what is happening in each photo of Corey? Right, so we're going to show you a photo of Corey doing something, and then you have to tell us what is happening, and then Corey's going to tell us what's actually happening. So let us have the first photo, please. All right, and uh, for those who are viewing, hit the poll if you want to see it closer. So, Allison, I'm going to give you this first photo. What yeah. is Corey doing? Well, I heard a lot about. Um, getting stung. And so I think this is actually a lip plumping technique. So <laughs> Corey is sucking the ants directly in. I don't keep up with the Kardashians, but I think this is um, going to market to rival, I think it's Kylie Jenner's lip plumper. So thank you so much for this organic solution. Yes, organic silicone. <laughs> That's a great yeah. idea. Corey, what is actually happening in this photo? Well, you're actually not that far off because what I'm doing is I'm aspirating ants. It's also colloquially called a pooter. And so what it is is a piece of glass <laughs> at the tip, which is what I'm holding. Then there's a screen and then this flexible thing. And that's so I can suck ants up to collect them. And the reason I say you're not that far off is 99% of the time the screen keeps the ants from flying into your mouth. Every now and then you will get a mouthful of ants and dirt. Which is so, high in protein. So you're <laughs> high in protein. And then I won't need Botox. I can just rely on the ant venom. Wonderful. That's so I nailed it. Great. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> Allison, I have no idea. Entomology superpower. <laughs> Next photo, please. All right. Aparna. Yes. Thank you so much for asking. In this photo, we clearly uh, see Corey um, giving herself a 23andMe test just to see her if her own DNA, if she goes far back enough, 
she is in fact related to ants, which I assume oh. we all are, if you go back far enough. Ants, the birthplace of civilization. Corey, how close was Aparna? She is actually really close as well. So I am doing wow. like a 23 and me, but on ants. So just like we can sort of use DNA to reconstruct our family history, we could do the same thing for ants. So we'll grind up ants, sequence their DNA, and we can figure out who's related to who. So fantastic guess. And you're absolutely right. We all sort of go back to shared evolutionary history, so we're related to ants. Yeah, and some of us have step ants as well, so. <laughs> wow, I love how the fact that you guys are like really close to what's actually going on. I think it's pretty incredible, you know? You know, science class did some wonders. Lisa, you get the final photo. Yes. Let's throw up that final photo. Wow, what's happening? Um, it's really small on my computer, and so I, I, I'm going to say from from my my work as a scientist in elementary school. Um, Corey is flying through the air to catch the male ants that are flying. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, I am sort of flying through the air. So a lot of the ants I study are only found high up in the canopy of the rainforests. So that's a field site in the Amazon where they have this little contraption where I have like a little remote control packed on my chest and I can drive myself around the canopy up and down and over trees and up next to them to collect. And in this case, I'm not just collecting the flying ones. I am collecting the ones running around on all of those rainforest trees. But it was a really amazing experience to be that high up and just alone with nature. At one point, I had a monkey come over to check me out. He was like, what is this other primate in this tree near me? Um, it was amazing. That's I actually incredible. was up there so long that I ran out of tubes. And I had to, on the way back, keep one group of ants in one hand. One oh. ant I put in my mouth and one I had the other hand and then had to drive myself with just my thumbs back down <laughs> to the forest floor. <laughs> ant collecting was so action-packed. How high are you off the ground in that? Yeah, place? so I'm about four or five stories off the ground, actually. Oh. So really high up there. And that's where, why are the ants in those trees as, as, uh, as opposed to like closer to the ground? Yeah, so there are some species that specialize and live only on the ground. There's some species that are only up in the canopy and never come down to the ground. So they've built their homes there. They find their food there. It's really remarkable that you sort of have this three-dimensional structure of the rainforest, and every single crisp corner is occupied by ants. Wow. Um, with, the, with the last five seconds, I, I'd just like to really thank you, Corey, for blowing up. Were you, were you, your minds were blown or what? Yeah, Good. definitely. Thanks. Speechless. Absolutely. I can't believe they live everywhere except Antarctica. Oh, right? Really? And I thought there was oh. like two kinds of ants. I thought there was just like the little fat ones and then fire ants. I thought that was pretty much it. <laughs> Who knew that they also tasted like lemons? <laughs> yeah. I thought they were mostly found in my kitchen. <laughs> Corey, thank you so much for blowing our minds. And thank you so much for doing the work that you do. It is absolutely incredible. See? Thank you so much for having me. Isn't it incredible? I love this. This is so this is so dope. We're going to bring on our next scientist, who is Ashley Lorenz. Ashley, come on through. Ashley leads the global outreach team at Microsoft Research, where their mission is to amplify the impact of research at Microsoft and to advance the cause of science and technology research around the world. Prior to joining Microsoft, Ashley served as the founding chief of the Intelligence Systems Center at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, where he directed research and development in artificial intelligence, AI, robotics, and neuroscience. Ashley, how are you? Welcome to our mashup event. Can I get five minutes on the clock? Five minutes, Ashley. All right. Well, it's great to be here. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Um, in five minutes, I want to share my passion uh, for artificial intelligence. And, you know, a lot of times we get a sense for AI um, from popular movies. And uh, it looks easy. We make it look easy. Uh, and so I want to give you a sense for why it's hard. Uh, and that's what I want to uh, leave you with here. But then there's also been some amazing progress. So when you think about what drives our human intelligence, 
Uh, we have goals in the world. We want to not starve. Uh, we want to advance the species, uh, et cetera, et cetera. What do we have to do um, in order to behave intelligently with respect to those goals? Um, we have to be able to perceive and understand the world. Uh, we have to be able to make decisions on how to act and how to behave, and we have to actually carry those decisions out. We have to do that as, as part of teams. Um, and so well, let's talk a little bit about these from, from an artificial intelligence standpoint. Um, you know, from uh, perceiving and understanding the world, uh, we do this through our five senses. We measure uh, touch. We measure light as it impacts our eyes. We measure sound as it impacts our ears. Uh, robotic systems, autonomous systems, they do this through different methods. Uh, I worked a lot with autonomous underwater vehicles, uh, and light doesn't travel very well uh, through water, not nearly as well as sound. And so underwater robots see with sound. Uh, and so that's a whole different modality. And so my research had to do with signal processing and machine learning to help machines understand the underwater environment to see with sound. Um, when you think about that compared to our human intelligence, um, there are things machines can do well, like recognize patterns, and not so well, like reason about those patterns. Um, let's take object permanence, for example. Have you ever played peekaboo with a baby? Uh, it's so funny to them because when you go behind your hands, you are gone. Uh, they don't have a sense for the fact that you're behind the hands. When you remove your hands, now you're back and you've appeared magically. Um, you know, in some sense, we're still trying to uh, create machines that are smart enough to reason about object permanence. Uh, th these are some of the ways that uh, perceiving and understanding the world for a machine through its sensors is hard uh, and, and uh, different than, than the way that we do it. So another thing that machines have to do to behave intelligently, machines or people, is to make decisions about how to act. Uh, if I'm thirsty, I have to decide to, uh, to cross the room and get a glass of water. The problem is there's so many different ways that I can behave with respect to my goals. Uh, that's a pretty big space, right? So when you think about, um, uh, there's a, I like to, to use movies. So when you think about uh, a Marvel movie, Infinity War, there's a, there's a scene where Doctor Strange uh, kind of goes into this state and, and then looks into 14 million different possibilities and how the battle with Thanos can turn out, and they choose the one path that works out. Um, and my reaction to that scene is, actually, that's a pretty small number. Because when you think about the game of Go, this is like a, a, a Chinese version of, of chess, um, and you think about the number of moves that are available to each player on each turn, uh, there's about 100 moves on the order of a few hundred moves available on each turn. So now when you play that game tree out and you think about the first move, 100 moves from that, and 100 moves from each of those 100, and 100 possible moves from each of those uh, 100 squared, that's a lot of possibilities. And in fact, um, their uh, recent research has shown, you know, there's more pathways through that game tree, more possible pathways as you and I make decisions as there are atoms in the universe. Atoms in the universe. That's how many ways we, a game of Go between me and you can play out. So how many ways do you think that battle with Thanos could really have played out? <laughs> right? Uh, many, many different ways. And so that's a reason why decision making is hard for both humans and machines. And it's really, really impressive, actually, that we've re recently seen a machine that can beat a human uh, in playing Go. Uh, and now we're trying to push the frontier to help machines do that kind of reasoning and decision making in the real world. And then finally, acting in the real world is difficult. Uh, there's a scene in, in the movie uh, Big Hero 6 uh, where the, the robot inflates in the bedroom and the robot is this big thing and there's these narrow spaces in the bedroom and the robot's kind of sneaking around the corners and that kind of self-awareness is actually really hard for a machine. Uh, and so, you know, all the evolution that our brain has done, we understand ourselves in the environment, how we relate to the positioning of objects in the environment, how to move, that kind of reasoning is actually difficult for a machine, uh, especially when you consider the unconstrained nature of the real world. And this is one of the reasons why uh, you, you know, things like uh, driverless cars and those kinds of things are actually harder problems than, than, we, give, uh, than we give credit for. So these are some of the ways uh, why artificial intelligence is hard, behaving intelligently, and yet some of the frontiers that we're, uh, we're exploring. And of course, the trick is to advance technology safely uh, in a way that benefits humanity, because there are also ways that uh, making machines intelligent can go wrong, and so we need to avoid those as well. All right. Absolutely. Fantastic, mind-blowing, artificial intelligence. Really quick question. How um, far are we away from the Terminator? Right. Um, I, I, is the Terminator possible uh, is, is, a, is an interesting question in its own right. 
the Terminator is, would be an example of artificial general intelligence uh, and also uh, conscious machines. We don't know yet actually if this is possible, a generally intelligent uh, machine. But I do think this notion of dystopian futures is important and having us focus on the right dystopian futures and avoiding them or, or the most likely. More likely than something like uh, Terminator would be a system that works too well. That is, if we give it a goal uh, and it advances that goal even in ways that cause unintended consequences. Um, like we have a, a cleaning robot, for example. This is a common example. We have a cleaning robot uh, and we say, do a great job cleaning my house. And that robot learns to do that. And you go to turn it off and it won't let you. Why? Because if I turn it off, it can't clean the house anymore. <laughs> right? Uh, that sort of thing. So I think avoiding unintended consequences uh, and, and advancing AI safely is uh, very important. That's brilliant. And on that note, we are going to go to our next game, which is called Just the Numbers Game. So um, there's going to be some numbers, and you're going to have to uh, guess the right one, comedians, and then uh, Ashley will give us the right one, kind of like a, a Price is Right kind of deal. And the winner is the one who gets to the closest without going over. Okay, so let's go to our first picture. These are underwater autonomous vehicles. Remus, 600 vehicles created by the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. It's a type of vehicle Ashley worked with for many years, developing machine learning and signal processing algorithms to help them see, quote unquote, and hear underwater. Here is your question to our comedians. How long can these vehicles operate autonomously? Let's go to these first. Uh, too long. Way too long. <laughs> I'm so us scared. <laughs> <laughs> give us a number. How long? Uh, I, I mean, any amount of time, it, it sounds terrifying to me. I, I'm going to say, you know, two months. <laughs> two months. Apana, give us a number. Okay. Well, I was thinking how long, I was like, let me compare it to myself. How long can I operate <laughs> autonomously? And I would say generously three hours and that machines are not as cool as me. So I would say two hours. Two hours. Allie, yeah. give us a number. Okay, I feel like I should just go nuts and say five years. Five years, Ashley, what is the correct answer? Okay, in the case of these particular vehicles, according to the Woods Hole website, it's about three days. <gasps> three days. So I think Lisa, I right. think that was you. You were the closest. It was definitely not me. It was not me. It was, uh, I think, Aparna. I mean, three hours is closer to three days than two months. You said by two months, right? <laughs> Yeah. Wow. I now, mean, that's be a lot somewhat shorter. comforting. If unexpected things happen, mm. and this gets to this notion of general intelligence, if everything plays out like you think it would ahead of time, mm -hmm. that's one thing. But if it, you know, a landmass or something shows up where you don't expect, then maybe three days becomes 30 seconds. Oh, <laughs> let's say a partner wins that round. But bing, let's go to our next picture. All right. So this is the su supercomputer used in the previous example. How much did this computer cost to build? Me mm. first. How much? Me first? Yes. How much oh. did this supercomputer cost to build? Oh, I mean, I know we just gave like $3 trillion for Space Force, I believe. Mm. So I'm going to say just shy of that. One one trillion? A trillion dollars. A partner. How much okay. is this supercomputer cost to build? Um I'm gonna I'm gonna lowball it and say five hundred million. Five hundred million dollars. And Allie, how much did this supercomputer cost to build? I have no idea, <laughs> but my MacBook Air was about a thousand. So, mm. you know, I think roughly let's just add a couple zeros and we're just gonna say you know i'm gonna lowball i'm just gonna do an extreme i'm, I'm gonna say a million and beyond the low end a million dollars ashley how much did it cost for that supercomputer built all right uh so this is the titan supercomputer from oak ridge national lab at one point it was the most powerful supercomputer in the world built in about 2012 decommissioned in about 2017 it costs around 100 million 
A hundred. A hundred million. Million dollars. Right. And it only worked for five years? It was the, it was the, yes. Like an NBA contract. Uh, yes. <laughs> That's excellent. <laughs> so I believe like a a was, uh, who, was, who was the closest on that one? I think that was a partner as well. Yeah. Is it? Or... Yeah. Arna, you crushed this round. Ali is doing great. I, wow. I don't even you know what I'm saying. Yeah. You said 500 million. That's probably the closest, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're killing this for somebody who hates science. You're doing great. <laughs> I, it's like you're good at the things that you don't want to be, you know? <laughs> exactly. Let us look at our third and final picture. Okay. Researchers are working towards simulating the natural world at the molecular level. How long did it take the Titan supercomputer in the last photo to simulate this molecular building block of HIV for a single microsecond? How long did it take the Titan supercomputer in this last photo to simulate this molecular building block of HIV for a single microsecond? How long? Let's go to a partner first. How long? I honestly couldn't follow most of the questions, so I'm going to say, I'm going to say one microsecond, because that's one what microsecond. I remember you saying. Right. Basically, how long did it take for the computer to build this image? The same time that it took to show it. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Allie, what's your guess? Okay, are you saying, like, how long did it? study HIV to then show that? How long did it take for it to create and display this building okay. block of HIV? Did it do it in it like... Think about it and then create it. Did it do it in like Microsoft Paint? Like, what are we talking about? Like, how did this um, happen? I, what I, are I the mean, tools? it's probably not Photoshop. I don't know. You know? <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I, um, yeah. Once again, just going to, you know, I feel like I don't have enough background, so I'm just going to say a minute. A minute. And this is Curry. How long did it take for this super? All right. So I think I'm going to give all the scientists the benefit of the doubt here. And uh, I'm going to assume that you only assigned this supercomputer good things to make. And so this is maybe like the computer's personal side project. So I'm going to say uh, four and a half years because it just was working on its time off behind everyone's back. Oh, smart. Boom. Four and a half years. Ashley, how long did it take the supercomputer to build that simulation? Okay, so this is an HIV capsid. And by simulating things like this, we can learn more about, you know, how to cure diseases like HIV. Sure, now, sure. The, the phenomena evolves very quickly. You can imagine things at this scale, at the molecular scale. So it was simulating the interaction of HIV um, with some different chemicals for one millionth of a second, simulating what this does over a microsecond, over one millionth of a second. So the answer is it took that supercomputer 180 days mm. to simulate the interaction of this little thing over the course of one millionth of a second. Okay. So I'm not interested in this Terminator scenario. <laughs> My feeling is if you can't beat them, join them. I'm more interested in Ashley implanting things into my brain. I think, are we gonna, is that gonna happen soon or can we? Uh, transhumanism, how, how long is it? Yeah, how, how far are we away from cyborgs, Ashley? Yeah, that's oh. a better scenario than Terminator. Well, if your question is how far are we from brain computer interfaces that could say enable you to control a robot? Okay. Been there, done that. We're doing it now. Right? Oh, wait, can I opt out of that indefinitely? That's, this is uh, now, it's not it's so terrifying. It's not something you can do tomorrow uh, because it's still an experimental technology. Um, mm -hmm. it, it happens in different ways. Some some involve actually going into your brain and having sensors touch. No, 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 no. Um, we're not yet being able to image through your brain with that level of fidelity. It's one of those Ashley. things where I get an email and it's like for $75 you can participate in a study because... <laughs> Right. Is this what we're agreeing to when we read the iTunes? <laughs> yeah. How do you know you're implanting it in a good part of my brain and not just directly into my nightmares? Right. They're all, these are all great good questions, good Ashley. Question for the next episode. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Ashley, thank you so much for giving us a, a, a look into the future of artificial intelligence and kind of scaring the hell out of us. Yes. Um, <laughs> we really appreciate you. That was fantastic. Mind blown. Um, I want to bring up our next 
uh, scientist who's actually one of my favorite people in the universe. And her name is Tracy Drain. Tracy Drain is a systems engineer at the Jet Propulsion Lab. She is the lead flight systems engineer for the Europa Clipper mission slated to launch in 2024. And that is going to explore the moon of Jupiter. Tracy Drain, it's such a pleasure to see you, my great friend. You got five minutes to blow our mind. Did you mute it? <laughs> oh, technology. There she is. <laughs> I'm working on the space graph, which can unmute itself, unlike me, apparently, which is heading out to go visit this moon of Jupiter. And the space graph itself is really cool. It's a solar-powered space graph going all the way out to Jupiter, which is five times farther away from the sun than the Earth is. And so it actually only gets one twenty-fifth of the amount of light out there. So it has to be enormous. It's got these two big solar arrays that stretch out to either side. It's so big, it hangs off the ends of an NBA-sized basketball court about 30 meters tip to tip. And the moon of Europa sits, like, orbits Jupiter and sits embedded in this kind of donut of radiation, I like to call it. And so the spacecraft also has to have a lot of features to protect it from that radiation. And we put the spacecraft into a big orbit around Jupiter instead of Europa, so we don't bathe in that radiation all the time, and do flybys of the moon really close in order to get a lot of data. So why do we care about the Europa moon? It's the fourth largest moon of Jupiter, discovered in 1610 by Galileo. And even though it is a little bit smaller than the Earth, it has more water under a shell of ice than all of the Earth's oceans combined. And scientists have a lot of really good evidence about this water being there because when the Galileo spacecraft visited the moon in like the late 90s, it found that Jupiter's magnetic fields was bent around the Europa moon. And on the Earth, our Earth's magnetic field lines get bent by the tides moving around because water is a conductor. And when they move around and are more on one place than another, they bend the magnetic field. And since that's happening, that gives them a really high confidence that on Europa, there's some kind of salty liquid as a conductor under that ice shell. Um, now, you might think, well, you just said it was really far from the sun. Like, why? How, how is it liquid like that? Well, it turns out that the moon orbits around the planet in an orbit that's not perfectly circular. So sometimes it's closer to the moon, sometimes it's farther away, and that means sometimes Jupiter's gravity pulls on it harder or pulls on it less. And that's kind of like press, release, press, release. If you take a paper clip and bend it back and forth and back and forth until it breaks and you touch the end, it's really hot. That's because of that friction of molecules moving together, and that kind of tidal heating is what generates enough energy in order to keep all of that ice melted underneath the ice cap. Um, things that scientists are, are uh, interested in, curious about the moon. Are there all the things necessary for life to develop on Europa? They wonder. So the things that we know about life, Jim, life as we know it, are you need water, lots and lots of water, check. You need uh, energy source. There's weak sunlight from the top and all of that thermal heat coming from below, check, check. You need chemistry. So the, there's this lovely acronym called CHINOPS, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur. And if those things are present, then maybe you have the ability for life to form. And scientists think maybe that stuff was there from when Europe formed 4 billion years ago, um, or was brought there by comets and asteroids and other things that have landed on it over the years. You also need a stable environment, long periods of time for stuff to develop. Well, Europa, the moon, has been simmering like this for about 4 billion years. So that gives lots of time if you have the right ingredients, you have water, you have an energy source for maybe life to develop. And you can kind of think about an analog on the Earth where way down at the floor of the oceans, way too deep for sunlight to reach, there's hydrothermal vents where heat from the magma underneath the crust heats water, which then goes jetting up and provides this great energy source. And if you see videos online, go Google this because there's really cool videos, you can see like teeming colonies of life forms that arise down there because you've got water, you've got energy, you've got all this chemistry, and it's been like that for a really long time. So scientists are curious about whether the moon Europa has all of those qualities. And my little baby space raft, when we get it launched in 2024, is going to take its time getting out to Jupiter, get in orbit around Jupiter, do some close flybys, about 50 of them, of Europa, and it's festooned with instruments in order to be able to measure lots of things about the moon, including the composition of the surface, whether there's dust particles, you might get lucky enough to fly through plumes that might be spewing up from under the ice and help scientists to answer all those questions and understand this awesome little place called Europa.
<laughs> Tracy Drain, this is why Tracy Drain is one of my favorite human beings. <laughs> Every time she says something, I, I just, I'm like, I can't believe humans are doing this. Like, and she's doing it. it. It's absolutely incredible. Okay, so here's what I want you all to do for our next game. Oh, boy. <laughs> Do you, if you all have a, a, a pencil and a piece of paper or a pen and a piece of paper, I would love you to all draw mm. what type of life form is living on Jupiter underneath all of that ice, based on what Tracy was talking about. Now, you underneath guys, the you ice? Guys, underneath the ice on Europa. What, what does it look like? What's growing on Europa? What's the life form? What does it look like? And if you have a name for it, Please do. You got one minute to draw. What do you think it is? And then you're going to tell us. It's going to, this is pretty hard to draw, <laughs> is the name of the game. Pretty hard to draw. And while you guys are doing that, I'm going to ask Tracy a couple questions. How long is it going to take for Europa, the, the Europa Clipper, to get from the Earth to Europa? You know, it depends a little bit on what uh, launch vehicle we end up to get there. But we had a bunch of different studies done in order to show kind of what our trajectories can be. And like, I think the maximum is something like five, five and a half years to get all the way out there. It took Juno, the spacecraft, five years to get out to Jupiter when we launched it in 2000 and wow, brain, it's been a long time now. Really, Tracy? 2011. <laughs> it took about five years because we had to go out past the orbit of Mars and then back by the Earth to do an Earth flyby to get a gravity assist to get going fast enough to get all the way out there to Jupiter in 2016. Now talk about these solar sails that's going to be on the Europa Clipper. What, what in actuality is, is that going to do? How does that help it get to Europa? Yeah, so for us, we actually have solar arrays, and we just use them in order to generate power, kind of like the solar arrays you might have on your house. And so those, the light from the sun falls on them, turn it into electrical power, and we use that to power all of the different components on board the spacecraft, including the, the, um, the latch valves that allow us to get fuel and propellant to our thrusters, which then make sure that we're on the right trajectory to get to where we're going. Now, will the, will, will the Clipper be leaving anything behind? Will it land on Europa? Or is it just going to fly by, check some stuff out, and then relay data back? Going to fly by and check some stuff out. Because uh, this one isn't going to be a lander. We do have a mission in the works that is, that is hopefully going to land on Europa at some point in the future, even though the movie 2001 told us not to do that. But uh, the Europa Clipper mission is just going to do multiple flybys and stay in orbit around Jupiter and then use each flyby of the moon by going by at the right altitude, at the right velocity, in order to give us the right trajectory we need to come back by, again, at a different area over the surface of the moon. Pens or pencils up, comedians. Let us start with Aparna. What creature? Okay. Do you perceive to be living on Europa under that. I planet? drew these. Um, I know they kind of look like chocolate chip cookies, but they're <laughs> actually uh, single-celled organisms, and they reproduce asexually. But they they are down to hang out, so they're not. They're not opposed to social, you know, engagements, but out they are called moon buddies. Nice. <laughs> moon buddies, the chocolate chip cookie that are socially acceptable, but asexually non-consensual. <laughs> yeah. Allie, what you got? What's living on your Okay. Road? Um, so Tracy, I, I listened very carefully. Um, I heard uh, that there's donuts of radiation. So that's, I tried to draw Homer Simpson. I can't draw. And his donuts of radiation. And then this is water. These are your plumes. This is your little spacecraft. Then I heard oh. you say a lot of elements. So this is the periodic table. It's living <laughs> there. Um, this is Olaf from Frozen because you said it's really frozen. And then these are the kids from Stranger Things because I think Europa sounds like maybe it's the upside down. Nice. And then you also said water is a conductor, so I drew a little conductor. And that's okay. what I think is living under the ice. I love wow. that. Those are so cute. Thank Phenomenal. you so much. An that's an amazing story as well. Like so, yeah. Thank you. I, it's idea I, idea I know stuff. you could really identify everyone just from my stick figures. They're really that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Thank Lisa, you. Lisa, what is living underneath the ice? I mean, 
I have, I had a couple Sharpies here, so I did some, I added some color nice. so that wow. you, to give you the full picture. So it's, um, cause I was thinking like, what would survive in that? Um, and the obvious answer is space piranha. Okay. And, uh, it, you could see it has very sharp teeth and a weird underbite, uh, because that's <laughs> like an effect of living out in space and, uh, it does have hands. Nice. Uh, as well as fins because you kind of need that and then i thought you know it must be so evolved uh so um also the back fins are color co they're different colors they're um on one side it's red and on the other side it's green just like boat lights you know like uh port and starboard mm. um so that's what we've going on here and and ideally uh i would have drawn this in like you know bright neon colors because you know not a lot of light so um yeah that's that's what's definitely living there love it sure. Space awesome. from jupiter already <laughs> sounds like a great film tracy jane thank you so much really appreciate you like i said one of my favorite human beings of all time wait what lives under there <laughs> We don't know yet. That's what we're going to do. We don't know. That's what we're going to do to go and find out. So, do we get a prize if we're right? Like yeah. once you're, you yeah. figure it out? If it's Homer Simpson and the kids from Stranger Things, I would like some credit, you know? Yeah. 10% oh, on the Europa Clipper. If Homer Simpson is <laughs> you guys. Tracy Jane, thank you so much. I appreciate thank you having it. Me. Good to see you. Um, and now, we're going into our final segment with Luke McKay, who is going to blow our minds. Now, Luke McKay is a scientist at Mont Montana State University who examines microbial life in extreme environments for clues as to how life began and where else beyond Earth life might exist. Luke, hello. You have five minutes. Blow our minds. All right. Thanks so much for having me. So I want you to imagine climbing into the tiny three-person Alvin Research Submarine. You're in the Gulf of California, and you're on the stern of an oceanographic vessel, the Atlantis. And you climb in the submarine. They lock you inside with two other people. It's so tiny, your knees are bumping each other. There's a pilot and another scientist. And then the A-frame crane of the Atlantis ship lifts you up and plops you down in the ocean. You're bobbing up and down with the waves, and then you begin to descend. And as you descend, for the first 10 minutes or so, you look out your little window and you see blue, beautiful ocean water. But after that, it gets completely dark. And for the next 45 minutes, as you descend, it's complete darkness and until you feel a little bump on the ocean floor. That means you're there. And you look out that little window again, it's pitch black because you're way past the photic zone where white light can reach into the ocean. And so the submarine pilot flips on the lights of the submarine and you look around and you see a massive oasis of life, this thriving ecosystem of giant crabs and octopuses and five foot long worms and carpets of colorful bacteria. And what's happened is that the pilot has taken you to a hydrothermal vent 2,000 meters deep in the Gulf of California. That's a mile and a quarter deep. And that huge, vast ecosystem of life is thriving there because of all of the chemical energy that is coming out from inside of the earth at the hydrothermal vent. So, that was me in 2008, 2009, when I was in grad school. If you fast forward 12 years to today, I do a lot of similar things in Yellowstone National Park. And Yellowstone is one of the uh, largest volcanoes in the world. It's massive. And there's a huge lake in Yellowstone that sits right on top of the hot spot of the volcano. And we use a remotely operated vehicle called Yogi, like Yogi Bear, that's attached to a ship and it goes down to the hydrothermal vents that these are only about 110 meters deep, but still very dark down there. And we take samples of these goopy streaming microbial life. They look like just gooey snot and they're waving around in the hydrothermal vent fluids. And this image behind me is actually an electron micrograph of what those organisms are in that streamer material. That's like as big as my hand. So, 
I study extreme environments, but why am I obsessed with these hot places? Like, why do I care about life in hot environments? Well, I mentioned chemical energy before. And what I mean by chemical energy is I mean chemical molecules that are very willing to get rid of their electrons. They're like, ah, I don't want them. I'm ready to give them away. So there's a lot of molecules like that, like hydrogen and sulfur and methane, and those molecules come out of hydro hydrothermal vents, and organisms can tap into that chemical energy. But it, they, they can't just use one molecule that gets rid of electrons. They have to couple that with another molecule that readily takes electrons, like oxygen or nitrate or sulfate. And if you can match that chemical uh, a gradient between molecules that want to get rid of electrons with molecules that want to take them, then you have the movement of electrons. And that's exactly how light in your house works. When you turn on a switch, that's an electrical gradient, that's electron flow. So that's, that's electricity. That's how all life on Earth works. But the cool thing about extremophiles at hydrothermal vents is they tap into these gradient environments but they're also some of the earliest evolved organisms on our planet. They've been, the lineages of these organisms have been around for billions of years, since shortly after the origin of life four billion years ago. So you can go to these very strange, unique chemical gradient environments and you can find organisms and understand how life may have been living right after the origin of life on our planet billions of years ago. And so, if you want to look for life and you want to understand the early evolution of life on Earth, then you would want to go to one of these extreme environments. Or for that matter, if you want to go and find life on an exoplanet or moon like Europa that Tracy just talked about, then what you would want to do is look for chemical gradients, energy gradients where life might exist. And with something like a septillion stars out there in our universe, each of which may have planets revolving around them that may support life. I mean, life has to be out there somewhere. The question is just how do we find it and where do we look? So uh, incredible, mind blowing. Who knew that Yellowstone would be this hotbed of the origins of life? That's incredible. There's so much I want to ask you about that. I mean, I don't know how much, we don't have very much time left because we don't want to get to the game, but there's really one question. Are there any similarities between the things that you study in these hotbeds and human beings? Yes. DNA. Um, we all have the, we have, we, we all have a linked evolutionary history. We use some of the same biomolecules, you know, we all have ribosomes that make proteins in our bodies. So do the tiniest, most primitive, uh, organisms. So we have genomes just like the tiniest, most pr primitive organisms that, you know, transcribe or, you know, that encode all of these enzymes that we need to live. So, yeah, there is a lot, actually, a lot of similarities between us and these micro these extremophiles. Incredible. Okay, so now we're going to get to our game. And our comedians. This game is called Two Truths and a Lie. I'm going to tell you two truths and I'm going to tell you three things. Two of them are true and one is a lie. And then you guys have to figure out which one is the lie. Okay, here we go. First, Luke met von Herzog while in line for the bathroom. Two, Luke once held a predatory seabird that barfed up a baby penguin and it had just eaten. And three, Luke watched the Super Bowl with Ja Rule at a bar in Latvia and then spent a, the rest of the night being chased by his bodyguard for reasons that mm. are classified. Okay. Which one of those is the lie? Can we, all, can we all answer separately mm. or we can discuss? You can discuss amongst okay. yourselves. Oh, okay. so we submit one answer. Okay. Okay, can we see them again? Yes, can we put them up on the board? Okay. All right. So did Luke meet Juana Herzog in line for the bathroom? Luke once held a predatory seabird that barfed up a baby mm. penguin and just, I, that one I think is true. Yeah, I think. Yeah, that, that one seems in, Yeah. Right. I see, I'm in the, I'm leaning, I want to pick one because it has the least details. Yeah, yeah. But then I'm leaning towards three because like, 
It's so. How do you have a full time bodyguard that can't? Uh, and it's Jaru. Not running that fast. Can you really have a? I, I'm pretty fast. Full time bodyguard at this point in his. Career? Yeah, does he, or is it just like a task rabbit thing? Yeah. Also, right. w- what did? Can we ask for more? Yes, let's ask. Let's ask Luke some questions. Okay. So, if you were to be chased, I mean, what would what would you have done? Like, I don't. I I, I think it's number one. You know, although number yeah, one, where was this? I think we need more context on the bathroom. Like, is this in line for mm. a porta potty at Coachella, or is this at JPL? Because that changes. Oh, my answer. Yeah, or was it also in Latvia? This was in New York. Oh, okay. And it was in line for a bathroom after a film screening. And Werner Herzog commits to tell me uh, how to end a movie properly. And the best way that you could, the, his favorite way of ending any of his movies that he has ever made, he told me. Okay, well, then I'm definitely going with number three. Yeah, I'm gonna go. Yeah, guys. You don't want more details about Ja Rule? Yeah, like I what? Mean, I do. Do you have I details on Ja Rule? Details yeah, the Giants were playing in the Super Bowl. We high fived every time they scored. Um, and then there were some drunken other Europeans there that offended Ja Rule. And I was uh, sort of in that group. And um, they something they said offended him, and I was associated with the group, so we all ran. And I don't know if it was his bodyguard, but it was his muscle or whatever. See, high fives made it not believable, but then you got me back with drunk Europeans. I was like, well, yeah. that's a thing we all yeah. have experienced. I mean, what could you have said that would have offended Ja Rule? G Unit? I didn't. I didn't say it. I don't even know. I just had to run. It also seems wild to be watching American football in Europe because isn't soccer That's a great point. football in Europe? They can crack the code. Although I'm really impressed if Luke like rehearsed his backstories for each of these. So now I want to ask you, like, I think it's you, two. I yeah, think like, what are what? Tell us about predatory seabirds. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this particular predatory seabird was a brown skua oh, in had- Antarctica. And uh, it was when I was in Antarctica on a research trip, and I was helping the, the folks who study birds measure the size of the, the predatory seabird. And it was actually a baby that had just recently been fed a baby penguin by its mom. And I was holding it so they could measure its wing, wait, wait, how wait, fast wait. it was Aren't growing. penguins huge? Did wait. you also just say that a bird fed its baby to the other bird? Uh, the predatory bird went and took a baby penguin, penguin. Okay. brought it back, oh, really? and was feeding it to the baby predatory bird. Oh, I see. Yeah. I see. Wait, how big are they? Do they what are they called? Scubas? <laughs> Scu- S- S-K-U-A. And they're like a large seagull, like bigger than a seagull, but oh, how is smaller than a pet. Get pet- out of here. They're small, small penguins, and babies are extra small. All right. Guys, what if they're all lies? Whoa. A a I mean, he's, he's he has, I know, but he had a story lies. for, maybe he's just a good liar. A partner, he's a oh, scientist. No. He's not a good liar. I think I'm, I I think I'm going three. Let's make a decision. It's Curry. Which one is the lie? I'm going three because Aparna had a really great point about watching. Fo- I mean, they would have been watching the Super Bowl at like two in the morning or something, which seems even more ridiculous. I, I, I agree with that. Number three, Aparna. Yeah, I'm also going to go with three for that reason. It's the bunch of Ja Rule haters. I'm, sti- I'm sticking with my ladies. We're all going three. Yeah. All going three. So, mm-hmm. Luke, which one is the lie? Three is the lie. Yes. Oh, <laughs> but, wow. but it did happen. It did happen to my brother. It's a true oh. story, but it didn't happen to me. It happened to your brother. <laughs> Do we win like I a scholarship your or something? Now? to the lies. That was well no, done. Was very, very, thank very, you. Very thank well you. Um, and probably the reason why John Rule is where he is today. Thank you so much, Luke. <laughs> for all of that. And thank you everyone for this wonderful mashup event. Lisa Carrier, Parna, Marcella, Ali, Goldberg. Really appreciate you guys have been fantastic. I love doing these. I love talking to scientists. I love talking to funny people as comedians. I love the Science and Entertainment Exchange and LabX. Thank you so much for having me host. 
Uh, I really appreciate it. And with that, I'm going to kick it back to Rick and Kate. Thanks, everybody. That was an incredible, you did an incredible job. That was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. Um, the chocolate chip cookies wow. got so me. Kate, uh, the chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kate, you want to uh, tell folks what's, what's next in the hopper for uh, LabX? Absolutely. So you got a taste of wrong answers only there um, with the fun game segments. And so the next wrong answers continues, the original type, continues September 23rd at 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, and that's Chris Duffy's going to be back to uh, wrangle the comedians. The featured expert there is going to be Amy Parrish, and she studies bonobo mating, which is, yes, it's ape sex. Um, so that should be a whole a whole other ball game there. Um, and if you're looking for tickets, you can head over to labx.org slash WAO. That stands for Wrong Answers Only. Rick, what's going on at the uh, exchange? I just got to say really quickly, Amy Parrish is amazing. You should totally see that. That is going to be great, Kate. I didn't know you had Amy for your next event. But um, oh, yeah. so the exchange actually has an event that I can't tell you about quite yet, but please watch your inbox because I think next week we are going to be sending you a really exciting event. It does have something to do with uh, with COVID and um, some sort of insider information that I think uh, you'd be interested to check out. Uh, it's either going to be happening next week or the week after before please watch your inbox because I think it's going to be a really uh, interesting event for, for everybody. Um, and with that, I think, uh, you know, thanks for coming today and we really appreciate it. Thank you guys. Kate? Hope to see you uh, next time. Thank you.